Welcome to The Learning Hack, a podcast about the people and technologies that are creating the future of learning. I'm John Helmer. Now, guess what? Learning is cool. Learning is cool. The word ecosystem was coined in 1935 by Oxford botany professor Sir Arthur Tansley to describe the way that living organisms, animals, insects, trees, plants, and the non-living components of their environments, mud, rock, sky, interact as a whole system. In our own century, when computer systems began to be more deeply linked together through the use of APIs, the ecosystem provided a handy metaphor, a way to think about how technology tools and the uses we make of them were beginning to change with this greater interconnectedness. Now in learning technologies, the word ecosystem is being used more and more, and here it signals a profound shift in what learning and development people are asking from their vendor partners. Except they say that this is not a monogamous relationship. I have a lot of other partners and I want you to play nicely with them. In fact, I'm going to ask some of you to get together to solve my problems where necessary. And I want every bit of stuff you supply me with to be completely compatible with every other bit of stuff I own. That's the ask, at least. And nobody is better placed to comment on how it's working out than the person I'm talking to today on the Learning Hack podcast, Danny Johnson. Previously with Burson by Deloitte, at that time probably the leading analyst company in the space, Danny broke away in 2018 to co-found a new consultancy, Red Thread Research, of which she is now principal analyst, and she recently completed a major piece of work on ecosystems, which I asked her in to talk about. But I kicked off our conversation in what has become the usual way, by asking how she got her start in learning technologies. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I actually am educated as an engineer. I have a master's degree in mechanical engineering. Um, Spent five or six years building cars in Detroit and then switched to HR. Um, As an engineer, it was really interesting to look at systems and processes in companies and realize that the biggest variable, most expensive variable, um, is is people. And if you can get the people right in the organization, it really compensates for a lot of the other processes that may not be as efficient or as as effective as they need to be. Um, From there, I went to work for Dave Ulrich, the RBL group. I don't know if, if you're familiar with him. And my, my most recent stint before we started Red Thread was as the Vice President of Learning and Career Research at Burson by Deloitte. About two years ago, Stacia Gar, my, my, my founding partner and I, uh, decided to go out on our own. We thought there might be a better way to do research, a little bit more interactive, a little bit more um, inclusive, and a little bit quicker to market. So we've been in business. We just barely hit our two-year mark, and things seem to be going fairly well. So I'd like to focus in this conversation on your recent work on ecosystems, which I saw you talking about at the Learning Technologies Exhibition. Um, And firstly, you make a distinction between intentional and unintentional ecosystems. What do you mean by that? Yeah, everyone has an ecosystem. Whether they want to, whether they want to claim it or not, is a is a different story. Uh, We, as part of this research, we had the opportunity to talk to thirty two really open uh, learning leaders. They were very open with us about what they were struggling with, but also about what kinds of technology they were using. In a couple of instances, we would sit down and they would say, "Um, I don't know why you're talking to me. I don't have an ecosystem. I only have an LMS. And then over the course of that conversation, we would identify 13 or 14 technologies that they were using for learning. 13 or 14 was that? Yeah, the average ended up being about 11 across all of the people that we talked to. Um, But it turns out that people use a lot more uh, technology for learning than they generally recognize. They generally recognize what's on their balance sheet, um, but people are using many more technologies. And so when we say intentional, we mean that L&D leaders are aware of the technologies that are being used for learning, and they're crafting the ecosystem to make sure that those pieces are working together to deliver the experience they want, but also to um, deliver the business results that they want. Yeah, I think you've used a couple of verbs in connection with the ecosystem. I think you said cleaning, crafting. You talked about designing um, the ecosystem. How how do you go about that? And and perhaps before I ask that, I should say, 
ecosystem's a buzzword, and and I'm very aware of the fact that people are very kind of uh, cherry about buzzwords because they tend to be ephemeral. They're very often not precise in meaning. Right. Uh, very often they're a new name for something we've already had before and got tired of, or they're a way of, way of trying to sell you something. They're a bit of a flag of, of convenience. So how happy and confident are you with the term ecosystem? And can you give us perhaps a, a, a definition? Yeah, that's a, actually a really good question. When we started this research, we tried out all, all kinds. When I was at Burson, we used a learning tech stack. Yeah. I've heard architecture. Um, the reason that we chose ecosystem is because an ecosystem is a whole bunch of things that work together to deal with their environment. And so an ecosystem doesn't necessarily have to be a bunch of smaller pieces. It can be one larger piece that interacts with, with its environment. But that's that's the sort of the defining difference and why we used ecosystem versus anything else. A learning tech stack is a, a list of technologies that you learn, use for learning. And architecture has more to do with the structure that you put in place. But an ecosystem is something that interacts with its environment and that continuously has to evolve in order to keep up with its environment. And that's what a learning tech ecosystem should do. It should continuously evolve to make sure that it's delivering the value that it should. Could you talk about the different types of ecosystem you saw in research? I gather it's got something to do with doors. <laughs> yeah. So as we were talking to vendors, we found that they basically fell into three categories and those three categories are on kind of a spectrum. At the very bottom, we had uh, organizations that were basically using one technology. They, they saw themselves as using one technology, and we call that um, a platform system or um, one door, one room. So there's one way to get into that room, um, and in that room is all the learning that exists in the organization, and there's one door to get there, one login. Everything is contained in that one thing. Um, interestingly, we didn't really talk to anybody that actually has achieved that. We did talk to several that are that are trying to get there, um, but but that was that was what it was. The second one is what we call one door, many rooms, and and that is the central system. With the advent of LMSs and more recently LXPs and a couple of other sort of platforms, there tends to be a focus on one central technology that then interacts with other technologies to fill out the experience. So for example, you have an LXP in the middle, but then you also have coaching software that hooks into that. You also have um, various different uh, content providers that feed that. It's basically one system, but then you can access all of the other systems with it. So that's one door. Everybody knows where to go for learning, and then they can dip into those other areas as needed, those different technologies as needed. And then the final one that we saw, or the one that is on the far left of the spectrum, is called a pure ecosystem. We talked to a few organizations that were trying to achieve this. Um, this is basically uh, many doors, many rooms. So they were not trying to centralize learning at all. They were actually trying to bring learning to the individual wherever they were. So they were trying really hard to integrate with systems that were already being used, uh, Salesforce, for example, or Slack, or any other business technology, they would do as much as they could to integrate the learning into those technologies, rather than having their people go to a separate place to learn. So those are the three kind of levels that we saw, depending on the characteristics of your organization, you would choose one over another, the other. And where do the, where, where is the, where are the numbers in those three? I mean, do you have most in the middle? Category. Yeah, we actually had the most just slightly right of that central system. So central system, people are comfortable with central systems because they can rely on one vendor to sort of make sure that their ecosystem holds up. Um, but more and more are e sort of edging toward that pure ecosystem. So it was just barely between, you know, just barely moving toward ecosystem from that central system. You said that there are relatively few of the people that have the kind of one door, one, one yeah. system. I mean, I'd like... Let's talk about a bit more about vendors a bit later, but it's, it's interesting to me that as a marketing person, I've written so much stuff about platforms where that is the default assumption of a vendor, that you'll yeah. use just our system or our suite and nothing else, one door, one system, whereas the, the reality that salespeople talk about is that they're going to a, a company and they've got five LMSs right. and they don't talk to each other and, and all the rest of it. 
But how would you sum up the main findings of your work in terms of how L&D and HR should orient themselves now with regards to learning tech because of this insight? Yeah, I mean, we've done this. we've done quite a quite a bit of research on learning tech in general. The the, the industry is exploding. Um, to just take into account the LMSs or the big LXPs leaves all kinds of options on the table that I think is dangerous to organizations. We're seeing a couple of things that is really interesting. The first one is there's so much money being dumped into learning technologies that um, we're running into founders, for example, who used to be managers and had a problem and said, I can make a learning technology that solves this problem. And then they did it and they got VC money and now they're off and running. There is going to be, I, I wouldn't doubt at all if there's going to be a small contraction, meaning there are going to be fewer vendors. Vendors are going to be eating other vendors. Um, but I think we're at a place in history where those smaller vendors have more legs than they've ever had before. It basically takes two guys, two people in a garage and uh, an AWS subscription to run a learning tech system. And that's vastly, you know, simplifying it, but there are going to remain several options in the, in the, in the space, in the vendor space. And because of that, we have to start thinking in terms of ecosystems, large ecosystems, not necessarily just one platform solutions. Interestingly, um, one of the questions I used to ask vendors is, okay, how do you you know, where do you sit in the learning tech ecosystem? Um, I don't even ask that anymore because most of them volunteer that information to me. They say, oh, we integrate with all these people or we can, we're, you know, working on our, our back end to make sure that we can integrate with all these people. They see themselves, these vendors are beginning to see themselves as part of a larger ecosystem rather than as a single provider. Um, the other thing that we're seeing that is sort of hinting at that is when you talk to learning leaders, their budgets are changing. Hmm. So they're not necessarily getting more budget, although we're seeing that too. Um, they're also getting different kinds of budget, different cadences of budget. So organizations used to get $10 million every 10 years to upgrade their LMS. Yeah. Now we're actually seeing that $10 million being spread over time so that it can continue to evolve and take advantage of new technologies that come into the market. There's a consultancy which you, you may know in the UK called Fosway. Um, yeah. They've divided up the market in a nine grid. Uh, system between suite players and um, specialists. I mean, it, it sounds to me that what you're, you're de- the picture you're describing there is a lot more specialists, maybe a move, move away from the suite, but the, the suite players are still really dominant and they're getting larger through M and A. You know, well, I mean, it, it really depends. I've, I've had uh, organizations that we've talked to that are just done with the platform play. And they're going after these smaller vendors and weaving them together to build something that they want. The other thing that we're seeing is because of all these different players in the market and because we're becoming aware of the way that we learn and the way that individuals learn, Mm -hmm. we're not just talking about platform players and individual players anymore. And it's really frustrating to everybody, the, the vendors, the small vendors, the large vendors, and the leaders in organizations when we try and divide things up into LMSs, LXPs, et cetera. Um, we actually have to, I think we have to granularize even further and look at the functionalities that they offer and to, to truly build an ecosystem that works for us. So we may use three functionalities in our LMS, and then we may use you know, a couple of functionalities from our LXP. It's not a one size fits all anymore and organizations are getting much better at determining what kind of experience they wanna offer and finding the technology to, to do that versus adapting a platform experience mm-hmm. and having to ad- also adapt the mindset that that platform was built on. One of the things that really attracted to me to your initial piece of research that I saw the wild was it the wild west frontier um, yeah. yeah 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 was that it it had a new taxonomy in there and it, it was very granular and it was like a folksonomy and that you'd gone around and looked at what people were doing rather than in a way creating a box of what they should be doing um, and, and I thought that was that was very interesting where where did it come from the the impetus to take that type of approach yeah. I, yeah, it came after months and months of struggling with it, frankly. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, the taxonomy is difficult. Um, what it really came from is talking to all the vendors and saying, what do you do? Not, what do you offer? Because they're just as frustrated. They're like, well, we're part LMS and part yeah, LSP. Yeah. We got some coaching. But if you say, no, 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 what do you do? They, they were able to say, these are the functionalities that we offer. Um, mm-hmm. And then as we looked at those functionalities, and there are about 30 of them, 
as we looked at those functionalities, they actually divided out really nicely into things that L&D folks should be paying attention to in their organization. So yeah. we should be helping people plan and, and connect and consume and all those types of things. Um, incidentally, we put out an a, a infographic yesterday on, on our website that basically just lists those functionalities and those things that L&D people should be paying attention to. All right. And how robust have you, I mean, this couple of, goes a couple of years back that you first did this. How robust are you finding that as a classification? Pretty robust. We started with 28 functionalities. Over the course of two years, we've added two more. So we're up to 30 functionalities. Um, who knows, you know, what's going to happen in the future, but we revisit it fairly often to make sure that it still holds true and that it's still useful to people. Yeah. I think it's really interesting. I think one of the interesting things about it for me, I think it's useful when I look at it, um, and I look at companies that I'm working with who have quite a broad offering in um, learning technologies, you know, they have platform, content creation, blah, blah, blah. And you put them onto that grid and suddenly you think, God, they, you look really narrow. <laughs> You're only in that one and you've got a little bit in there. And there's all this other stuff kind of going on. What, what's that about? Is that because, you know, those of us who are kind of in the digital end of, of learning are just so focused on the, the the tech and the digital side that we 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 just don't see, you know, the, what a big thing learning and development is, and how many non kind of digital things there are that you can't actually make a technology for. Well, I think it's two things. The first one is if you have a platform and a way of thinking about learning, um, which has literally until the last five years, it's been the same for a hundred years, right? Like you have classroom. Um, we took the classroom online, but it's basically the same types of things that we're doing online as we did in the classroom. So, so if you build a platform around that idea, then you're kind of limited in what you're going to offer. So that's number one. Mm. The, the second thing that I think is happening is that vendors are finding ways around the fact that these things used to not be tech enabled. You know what I mean? So one yeah. example is coaching and mentoring. It used to be a spreadsheet in an HR office of who's coaching who or who's mentoring who. There are, I looked the other day, there are, there's a, there are at least a hundred vendors that say that they offer some sort of technology to aid with coaching and mentoring. And so everything that we used to think was, you know, part of L&D, but not necessarily enabled by tech is now being enabled by tech in some way. Hmm. And those larger platforms sometimes don't see that. And because they're does sort of uh, describing learning and development so narrowly, they miss those other opportunities. And how does this new perspective, do you think, change the way that buyers view their vendors? And what, so what does that mean for vendors in the way that they engage with their customers? You know, I talked earlier about what, uh, how vendors just want to own the customer. Right. Um, and, you know, and the sweet players kind of come with us and don't see any of that other stuff anywhere else in the market. Yeah. You know, buyers clearly are pushing back against that with with the, the idea of an ecosystem. Do vendors have to change, you think? I mean, I, I see their language changing. I, I don't know if they're yeah. they well, their language is, changing. Yeah, their language is changing, but all so their experience has to change. So I've heard a couple of things come up in the last few years that I hadn't heard before. Um, customer experience. So we're not just talking about the learning experience anymore. We're also talking about how easy those vendors are to work with. It's becoming a really big deal. Um, it's a it's a differentiator in the market. The other thing that we're seeing that I think is really interesting is, and it surprised me actually, we had a couple of leaders that we talked to that said, oh yeah, when I have a problem, my vendors know they have to work together to solve it. And so one woman said that she pulled five of her vendors into a room and said, I have this problem. Your systems are all involved, fix it. And so those vendors are having to work with each other as well as with the, the client in ways that they've never had to before. Yeah. Is this because of the API? Is this what's at the root of it? I mean, if you're looking for a kind of tech cause for this, it, it's made everything connectable. So now it creates an expectation that everything should talk to. Yeah, I think so for, for sure. We're seeing more data created, but we're also seeing more data absorbed by these technologies. And your technology basically runs on the kind of data that you can get into your system. And so if somebody is learning over here in one, one part of the organization and it can help me to help my technology function better, I want yeah. to absorb that information. And so leaders are aware of this and they're saying, I want everything to talk to each other and I want a full understanding of what's going on as far as learning goes, but those vendors are motivated to do it as well. It's not necessarily, it's definitely difficult, but it's getting easier um, and it's getting necessary. They're seeing a real benefit in making sure that they can talk to other technologies, not just so that they can sell it that way, but also mm -hmm. so that they can absorb that information and make their tech that much better. 
I've worked with a lot of companies in learning technologies, but there are none I would recommend as wholeheartedly as Learning Pool. They have some of the most leading edge, award winning tech around, but also an approachable, honest style that means they're equally at home helping people take their first steps in digital learning. They're great with organizations small and large, they do platform, content, authoring, analytics, and more, and have a 98% customer satisfaction rating. So if you have a problem to solve or an opportunity you need a can do partner to help you make the most of, go to learningpool.com. The eCode system work, I think, is, is really interesting. There's more we should say about it, but I'm kind of conscious of the fact that you're, you're probably working on something, you know, you've been there, done that, probably working on something new. What, what are you looking at at the moment? Yeah, we're working, at, <laughs> we're working at several things. Um, right now, I'm writing a paper on responsive organizations. So when right. Station and I started this firm two years ago, we took a look around and realized that there are some organizations that just respond better to their markets. And some organizations that are so sort of stiff and structured that they're not they're not able to respond. And so we've spent the last six months talking to organizations and crunching numbers and taking a look at why some organizations can do that and why some cannot. Mm. So so that's one that's really interesting to me. Um, I'm this, also sorry, this is particularly organizations responding to their market or to the. Yeah, well, just responding in general. So responding to, we've found that organizations that are responsive to their market are also very responsive internally. It takes some really different types of structures and thinking in order to be responsive to your external stuff. Um, And those same structures make it really easy to respond internally as well. This is about culture. Yeah, culture. Uh, Culture and the way that we do things. So um, structure was a big part of it, but... But yeah, like how how we do things and what kinds of freedoms we allow people that help us respond externally. So what new groundbreaking insights do you think we can expect to see from you as a result of this work? Do you, do you see um, in a particular direction? Yeah, well, we, we've put together, we finally finalized a model on what it means to be responsive. And basically there are four levels or four layers. The first basic layer that all organizations need to be responsive is respect for their employees. Um, which I found heartening, um, but also very interesting in the types of things that that define respect. The second one is distributed authority. So a lot of times we hold authority and decision-making at really high levels in the organization. Mm. Um, As you push that information down and as you push the the authority down, organizations are able to respond more easily. The third one is transparency and growth. This is one of my favorites because I'm a, a learning geek, but it turns out that that third layer one of the things that really distinguishes responsive organizations is the ability for organizations to share information really broadly, but also to um, make sure that their individuals have the tools and the resources that they need to continually grow and develop. And then the fourth one was a little bit of a surprise to me, but it's uh, trust. And that has a lot to do with community building and um, everybody being on the same page and understanding where they fit in the larger picture and having a a purpose to to belong to the organization. So um, this was an interesting study in that we are data geeks. We love data. Um, And a lot of the things that that, that turned out to be really, really important have a lot more to do with, with, as you mentioned, culture and um, sort of the touchy-feely part of of human capital. Mm. Uh, But but things that I think we really need to revisit in order to make sure our organizations are going to survive into the future. What would you say to somebody who said that your starting point there is the idea that a responsive organization is a good thing and doesn't that just mean your organization becomes incredibly reactive and just you know every twitch on the thread it's changing direction um that's not necessarily the same thing as agility how do you uh, how about organizations that have a narrative of you know we are here we have a five-year plan um of where yeah. we want to get to and you know, going to change in stages and you know we see yeah. this kind of distant peak that we will we we will get to is that a completely different orientation is that dead now as a way of corporate planning yeah <laughs> <laughs> i mean to be sure like we think plans are great but if yeah. you have a five-year plan and you visit it revisit it every two and a half years to make sure you're on track you've missed it you know what i mean think yeah. of kodak and how long it took digital cameras to take over their entire market um things are changing so rapidly that those plans have to re- be revisited on a quarterly basis. And in order to do that and be able to make the adjustments you need, you've got to be a responsive org. I'll make a mental note never to answer a question, which means you just <laughs> say yes. And- <laughs> so,
So talking more generally, how do you see the current state of organisational learning? Um, and what do you think of the direction that it's going in at the moment? I'm optimistic by nature, um, but I, I'm really optimistic here. I think um, I think we're, we're finally seeing leaders and organisations that have a different mindset than that that was created in the 60s, you know, learning theory and objectives and those types of things. I think they provided a good base for a long time, but I also think that organizations need to adapt much more quickly. People need to learn much more quickly. Um, and some of those old ways of doing things are going to hinder us in the future. And so I'm very, very optimistic. I'm also, the coronavirus is a horrible, horrible thing. Um, and it's devastating to pretty much every aspect of our lives. <laughs> um, but I think it'll be really interesting to see what comes out of it when it comes to learning and development and the way that we run our organizations. Um, I think some of the things that we have thought were necessary for a really long time, <clears throat> face-to-face learning, for example, or um, longer courses, or some of those things that LNG just seems to be holding on to, I think they're going to give way to having to figure it out. You know what I mean? Um, and I think it's a little bit of a metaphor for how how life is going to be going forward. Hopefully not, you know, always yeah. in under constant threat of a virus, but um, as organizations have to react more quickly, learning and development also have to react more quickly. And I think this is um, a, a catalyst for, for how we're going to have to act in the future. You being so optimistic kind of puts a burden on me to um, come back at something <laughs> with something a bit less optimistic, a bit more pessimistic. Uh, what I've seen in the last few days, um, and perhaps the last week, is... Uh, Everybody is getting an uptick in their kind of uh, their web figures and their inquiries coming in. A lot of people are taking in their entire sort of workforce online very quickly into online meetings, yeah. uh, and also all their learning and development and all the, the the communication functions around that happening very quickly. But what I'm also hearing is that people in the, in their search to frantically get everything online are going for very traditional options, uh, LMS plus content. You know, they're not necessarily looking at the, the kind of sexy LXP stuff. Yeah. Um, isn't there a danger that um, somehow the, the, we, we perpetuate a baked-in model as the numbers move very quickly to adopt uh, and adopt in a, in a perhaps uneducated way? I don't think so. Um, I think you always start with what you know. And I think a lot of the organizations who are not, who don't have an LMS and who have not put any of that stuff in place, not a bad place to start. LMSs are, you know, they have their purpose and, and their reason. It's a safe option um, and it's an option that can be built upon as they move forward. And so I think that's kind of where we are. Everyone's going to what they're most familiar with or what they've heard most about. Um, they'll implement that. And then, then as, as things continue to change, we'll see new options being introduced and, and we'll fix, I guess, or... Um, yeah. revisit some of those decisions and, and make better incremental changes moving forward. Well, you turn me completely around now. Now the glass is <laughs> half full. <laughs> it's my job. Finally, I'm going to ask you a question that um, I asked people at, at, at Christmas when we were la- looking back and looking forward. Um, and I mean, it seems appropriate in a way because this is like, you know, almost like a new year and in fact actually yeah. more meaningful than a new year because there is a complete new normal that we're going to have to get used to for at least a, a number of months. Uh, and that is what what have you seen uh, most recently do you think in the, in the learning technologies mar- market? Number one that make you want to pump your fist in the air with joy and number two want to make you want to punch yourself in the eye. <laughs> um. Well, um, I did a webinar a couple of days ago that kind of talked about the, the 10 trends that took us from the last decade and will help us sort of move forward into the, the new decade. One of the things we talked about were some, some new applications that I think are really interesting. With the amount of data that is being collected and um, sort of fed through systems, all kinds of things are available that weren't available before. Three things that I think are really interesting is this idea of nudges. So, you know, instead of instead of reminding somebody via email or checking in with someone every six months, we now have the option to kind of see what they're doing and nudge them without, without human interaction, which um, can depersonalize it um, and make it more acceptable to get some of that feedback, um, but also uh, be, be more timely. So we take some of the, the variability out. I think that's great. Yeah, um, some we're people also are building that into their uh, LXPs, I think. Yeah, I think for sure. Yeah. yeah. 
um, we're also seeing, I'm calling them coaches on the shoulder. But we're seeing technology act as coaches. So, you know, you're writing an email and um, it can sort of pay attention to what you're writing and say, hey, this sounds, you know, really harsh or you're being too passive or whatever and give, give feedback to that person in the moment so that they can continue to learn and grow and develop as they're working. I think that's a really interesting thing. Um, things that make me want to punch myself in the eye. Uh, this fascination with gamification, I just don't understand. I think fascination with what, sorry? Gamification. Oh, gamification. Yeah. yeah. I think if you have to tout the fact that you're gamifying learning, you've already lost the race. Uh, I think if you have the right learning culture and the right type of engagement, you don't need the, the, the added sort of heft of gamification. And I'm also really curious about AR, VR. Um, it's been around for a really long time. It's finally cheap enough to do something with it. I've seen some really interesting applications, um, but I, I think there is there may be a tendency to overuse it um, yeah. and also make it heavier than it needs to be. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I echo that. I think it, it's really interesting what people are doing with AR and it's kind of a VR especially, and people are moving into the area of soft skills with it. Um, I do have a slight suspicion, a slight worry that you get a lot of VR experiences which are a load of people standing around in an office environment in suits, not <laughs> but rather static. And, you know, it becomes like one of those very early kind of video games where, you know, it's very isolated <laughs> and people move very slowly sure. and, you know, you ask the wizard questions and things like that. And then five minutes later, the, the, the screen refreshes or whatever. I, I don't know. That's just me, maybe. Anyway, Danny, thank you very much. You you don't filibuster. Uh, you know, when I ask you a question, you answer it, um, and, <laughs> and it's very kind of well put together and um, and admirably brief. You know, if, you know, so many people in our industry, you just kind of turn them on, and um, you have to throw something at the screen to um, interrupt them. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but so that was great, and I, you know, I'm sure the listeners will have got something out of that. Um, and thank you very much for doing it. Thank you very much for your time. It was my pleasure. Thanks for asking. That's all on the Learning Hack podcast for this time. Many thanks to Danny for coming on the show and to our new sponsor, Learning Pool. The Learning Hack is completely independent, transparently funded by sponsorship. Please subscribe on your podcast platform of choice to get future episodes automatically. And if you're keen to help other people find us, please give a review and a five-star rating. If you want to sponsor or give any feedback, you can reach me at John Helm on Twitter or through my website, johnhelmconsulting.com. Next time on The Learning Hack, I talk to the guest who surprised me more than any other we've had on the show so far. I thought I knew who Steve Deneen was and what his company Fuse was all about. It turns out I didn't. And the true story is a really inspiring one. Don't miss it. Now I finally get it. Excuse the dog barking. No worries. This is this is a typical working from home scenario, I have to say, because you know I, I, I always work from home all the time anyway. Um, so you know, listeners will be used to odd sort of bumps and noises, you know. And as I always say, writers working from home and self isolated since the dawn of recorded time. That's true.